back and. Is there a secret knock on everything? Uh, no. Uh, uh, okay. Are you picking up this mic? Now you're looking at it, and I'm not. I wasn't well, noticing it. Voices in there. We, I might not tell them though. Uh, is it on the other side of the yeah. house? Okay, let me go over and let them, because earlier today I heard them a little bit. Yeah. Okay, we're ready anytime you are. LBJ was an impromptu president, and you would get impromptu uh, demands and an impromptu bawling out. But in ba being bawled out, it was so funny that you couldn't get mad. You'd just have to laugh about it. I was sitting at my desk one morning, minding everybody's business, which I assume you were supposed to do when you worked at the White House, when suddenly the phone rang three times. That meant POTUS, the President of the United States. And so I picked up the phone quickly and he began, Liz, if there's a mistake that hadn't been made in this wedding, it's cause you haven't thought of it. My gosh, I wondered, uh, he went on. Dave Dubinsky, the head of the Garment and Hat Makers Union, uh, is in my office and he said, all my life I've supported you and you have, uh, and you've been wonderful, but your little girl is getting married and she's wearing a dress without a union label. Then there was this pause and Johnson said, get one. Well, sure enough, Lucy had bought a dress from uh, Priscilla of Boston who didn't have a union label. Uh, Bess Abel and I got together, got on the phone to hopefully Willard Wirtz, Secretary of Labor. He wasn't there. So we took uh, Jim Rutledge, who was in the Meat Cleavers Union, <laughs> and he was glad to have an excuse to run over the White House. And he came over and we got Priscilla of Boston on the air and said that, uh, you know, why didn't uh, Lucy's dress have a union label in it? And she said, I'm not a union shop. I pay more than union wages. And she says, it's that uh, an organizer in Boston, he always is trying to find somebody and embarrass me. So we got immediately on the phone to um, the person she referred us to, and that is a lady who had a, a uh, I'm not telling this well. Well, start over. Okay. okay. Do I have to start clear over? No. Where, where, where do you want to start? You, 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 you got Priscilla on the phone? We got Priscilla on the phone, and she said she wasn't going to unionize, but she did have a possible solution. She had a friend who was a union shop, and she could assemble the dress over there. Uh, but that the women that she hired are the only ones who could do those tiny seed pearls on wedding dresses. So we started in on another dress. And I'll never testify as to which dress Lucy wore, but at least it satisfied Dave Dubinsky and it satisfied the president. Uh, he also could send you to the Hill. And during the uh, highway beautification bill being up on the Hill, again, I got one of those calls. Uh, it was called the Ladybird Bill. And LBJ called me one morning and he said, Liz, I want you to put on your tightest girdle and your best perfume and I want you to go up to the hill and see George Mahon and Omar Burleson, two West Texas congressmen I knew very well, and tell them I want the Lady Bird bill passed. So I did just what he told me, put on the tightest girdle and the best perfume, got up there, went to see both of them individually and both of them had the same uh, uh, the same excuse. I'd like to vote for her bill, but the billboard lobby, those were the, uh, that was the purpose of the legislation, to make them move the billboards back from the roadsides. But the billboard lobby, they said, uh, is really rampant in my district. Well, I got back to the White House in about an hour and a half, and LBJ had already called three times because he really was a creature of the hill and he was dying to know what they were saying on the hill. Well, uh, I went over to see him, 
And he said, what'd they say? So I told him exactly that they were complaining, uh, that they said the billboard lobby was hot on their trail. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I think that we'll get George Mahon. I don't think we'll get Omar Burleson. He said, you go to that phone and you call Omar Burleson and you tell him Air Force bases can be given and they can be taken away. <laughs> so I went right to the phone and called Omar and Burleson, Omar Burleson said, just laughed. And he said, oh, that's the same thing he told me when he called me at, after the wheat bill vote, for the wheat bill vote. And, and Omar Burleson said, that's the same thing he told me when he called me to vote for the Russian wheat bill. Uh, and uh, he threatened me again that he was going to take away the Abilene Air Force Base. Well, the end of the story is that we did pass the legislation, and sure enough, we got Mahon's vote, and we lost Omar Burleson. So I thought I'd have some fun, and these were the days when you could have some fun in the White House. And I called uh, uh, Omar and said, you should know that the president is uh, announcing today uh, that the Abilene Air Force Base is being moved to Palm Beach. And that's because, the, to our surprise, Paul Rogers from Palm Beach had voted for the legislation. And he screamed again. But that was the way it was, a kind of a good-hearted, hard-working, rollicking time in the White House. Should I do any of that over? The president was strong for women, and uh, I, again, was standing one time in the elevator when he got on, and he grabbed hold of me, and he said, move my hand. The president's support for women and women's rights was apparent. Uh, he didn't brag about it, but it was clear to me. One day I got on the elevator, and there was the president, and he just began talking, and he said, Liz, Anna Rosenberg tells me that I don't have enough women in high places. Uh, get, find Esther Peterson, and you all be at the cabinet mo meeting in the morning, and tell us what to do about it. So again, I grabbed Esther Peterson, who was in charge of the Women's Bureau, and we were there at the cabinet meeting, and the president explained it to the cabinet, and he said, now I bet that, that around this table, every one of you all have a stack of applications in your, uh, out in basket, and you are trying to uh, just pass them over, see who you can, uh, get to elevate in a, a job what women what women are worthy of getting higher jobs and he said and these were the magic words and report back to me on Friday and so sure enough uh, on Friday uh, there were enough of the cabinet members had found ways to elevate some women in their departments that the president could announce 53 new appointees or elevations of women into the uh, to the uh, higher positions and sure enough that uh, he announced it at the women's national press club all 53 much to the dismay of pierre salinger who at that point was his press secretary and salinger said don't ever do that to me again i should have had biographies of all of them well you take them as you get them those were uh, wonderful days. And there was another occasion when, after the 64 election, uh, and he had been very conscious of the fact that wherever he went to campaign, there were quite a few women covering him uh, for the campaign. And so he called me in and he said, what can I do, Liz, to help newswomen? I want to do something for them. Well, we had just the thing. They, National Press Club had excluded women except uh, let them sit in the balcony on occasions to cover all the parade of state uh, visitors that they had there. And I said, if you can possibly do it, uh, tell the Department of State not to book the visiting prime ministers and kings at the National Press Club unless they let women cover on the same level that men cover them. 
And so, sure enough, he didn't brag about it, but it happened. We were invited to sit on the floor of the, uh, the National Press Building and cover the Prime Ministers just like uh, anyone else. And that led later to the admission of women at the uh, National Press Club. That's a great story. LBJ uh, was a telephone addict and a favorite time to call people was when he was up in the middle of reading something in the middle of the night and he wanted to get a hold of somebody and he didn't mind at all calling them at that time. The uh, prima case was when he wanted something done by Congressman Wayne Hayes of Ohio and so it was about 1 a.m. in the morning and he got on the phone and called, and when Wayne Hayes answered the phone, he said, say, Wayne, did I wake you up? And he wasn't at all perturbed that he had, and Wayne Hayes said, no, Mr. President, I was just lying here waiting for you to call. Um, let me think, uh, telephone stories. I'm sorry, I've got a, no I've gone blind. Okay. In the December following the assassination, uh, Chancellor Earhart was coming to visit, uh, and the McGeorge Bundy and all of them thought that the best thing would be for the, us to have him down at the LBJ Ranch. They didn't know that that was about 13 miles from the closest head of fresh lettuce, but we went down there ahead of time. And it was at that time that Van Clyburn uh, had just won the uh, Piano Award in Russia. And so we got on the phone, Bess Abel, the social secretary did, and got hold of him and uh, invited him to come play uh, at the ranch. Now this is December and it's uh, the only place we had indoors to have the barbecue in honor of Chancellor Earhart was at the Stonewall Gymnasium. And so uh, she and I went out in a pickup truck and collected all the saddles and boots we could to cover up the holes and make it look, you know, uh, country-wise acceptable. Um, LBJ wanted to give uh, a hat to all of the visiting group with Chancellor Earhart, which was about 40 people. And so he got hold of somebody who made hats and he got them over there and uh, to present individually. But also at that time, Van Clyburn uh, had resisted uh, he wanted to wear white tie and tails. And Bess Abel said, not when you play at the Stonewall Gymnasium. They have not even seen a tuxedo there. She wanted him to wear a checkered shirt. But instead of that, they compromised on a business suit. And it was ideal in, uh, entertainment because not only uh, was Chancellor Earhart a, a frustrated uh, concert pianist, but so was Pierre Salinger, who at that point was still the press secretary to President Johnson. It was a marvelous event. Uh, everybody played the piano, the chancellor, Van Clyburn, and Pierre Salinger. And then LBJ uh, decided to get, present individually the hats to each one of the 40 uh, Germans in the, in the in uh, tourage. And so uh, he, uh, looked to me and told me to crease the hats. I didn't know how to crease hats. And he said, she doesn't know how. A.W., it's talking to A.W. Morrison, get over there and crease those hats the right way. And so the, individually, this neighboring rancher uh, got up and creased each hat uh, personally. That was uh, another example of Johnson and uh, doing it yourself on the ranch. He was full of ranch lore uh, at one time, and this is where I really found out about what your job entailed when you went to work for LBJ. Uh, LBJ was out in the pasture being interviewed in this bucolic scene uh, with, by Walter Cronkite. And they were standing there uh, talking, 
And uh, he looked over out of his eye, LBJ did, and saw his best cattle in the distance. And he stopped the cameras and he said, Liz, get behind those good cattle and shoo them on up here. He said, these people don't know a milk cow from a bull. So I found myself behind this 2,000 pound bull saying, shoo, 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 and to get it up in camera range. And uh, suddenly the, the Dale Malachek, who was the foreman, looked over at me and he said, isn't it wonderful to occupy a high policy position in Washington? Uh, so that's how you know that you were called on to do anything. But so would he do anything. He would scout uh, uh, for candidates. There was a day that a Sunday afternoon I was watching Marshall Dillon, uh, a rerun of Marshall Dillon, uh, a TV show on camera one afternoon. And I got this call. It was a Sunday afternoon from LBJ. And he said, uh, Liz, I'm wanting to find a, a woman to appoint as U.S. Treasurer. And there's this woman on television who has had a lot of experience with money. And I thought, oh my God, not Miss Kitty. Miss Kitty was a Marshall Dillon character. And he said, no, I don't know which party she's in, Democrat or Republican, but find out her name and we'll offer her the job. So again, you're sent on a scouting exposition by LBJ personally to uh, round up uh, the, all the information about the lady who was on camera. And sure enough, we couldn't afford her. He offered her the job. Uh, her name was Miss Walsh, but uh, she already had a high policy position in her own banking institution. There, um, stop a minute. Well, I can't even remember. During the early days, uh, after LBJ became president, the size of the Secret Service uh, entourage multiplied, of course. Uh, and at the ranch, uh, they would hang out in the kitchen of the ranch. Well, LBJ came bolting through the kitchen one day, and he looked around and saw 32, by actual count, Secret Service men there drinking coffee, his coffee. And you could just see the blood rise in his face. And he looked furtively all over the room and he said, SWAT flies. Well, everybody turned their eyes to Rufus Youngblood, who was the head agent. And Rufus didn't know quite what to do. But finally, in that kind of Georgia country boy manner he had, he get, laughed, went over, picked up a fly swatter and said, well, I guess flies are a security problem. Are any of these any worth? LBJ was a very inclusive president. He liked to include everybody, sometimes far too many when he started packing them in his car, riding around the ranch, and he'd have to let somebody out in Johnson City and then tell them he'd be back in 20 minutes, and sometimes he forgot them, which happened to Irvin Duggan on one occasion. He ended up having to phone back to the ranch and remind somebody to come get him. But I never saw his inclusiveness mean more than the time we held our first big diplomatic reception. There are about 160 diplomats in Washington. Most of them have wives. And once a year, the White House has a diplomatic reception. And on this occasion, uh, LBJ wanted to pay tribute to them. And so he liked to dance, incidentally the two-step, but nevertheless he liked to dance and he liked to change parties often, uh, pray, change partners often. And on this occasion he was dancing around and he spied me and he summoned me over to him while he was on the dance floor and he said, go get me a woman from each continent. And what that meant translated was, go and find the wife of somebody from each continent. Uh, and bring her to him to dance. And I did that, and he got so carried away that he said, now go get one from each country. This would be about 160 women. And it took both Robin Duke, who was the wife of the, uh, our chief of protocol, and myself to, to give every one of those 160 women a chance to dance two or three steps with the White House.
But there were also poignant moments uh, when this happened. And one time when Sarah Vaughan was singing at the White House, uh, after this uh, ceremony, uh, they had a social hour. And then when she was getting ready to leave that night, Bess Abel, the social secretary, found her in tears. And Bess said, oh, I'm so sorry, what's the matter? And Sarah Vaughan said, do you realize that 20 years ago, I couldn't have come to the White House. I couldn't even uh, be invited to the White House. And tonight I was invited and the President of the United States danced with me. Let me think. Is that any good? I could read this stuff. One of the times that LBJ was really impromptu on a visit abroad, uh, we were in Pakistan, and uh, he had bolted out of the, he was vice president at the time, but he had gotten out of his car to go shake hands with the hundreds of people along the way, and he spied this camel driver, an humble man standing there by his camel, and he said in passing, come to see me at the ranch sometime. Well, there was a mischievous columnist who overheard this, and he wrote it uh, in the newspaper the next day. And we began in the press office to get lots of questions. Uh, is the president going to have the camel driver over to the uh, LBJ ranch? And it became such a story that uh, the vice president, Johnson, said to me, I'm going to tell this differently. What was the name of the camel driver? Um, no, no. I hope I can tell this. We were traveling in Pakistan, and the roads were lined with uh, people, natives, turned out to see the first vice president who had been there in uh, the whole history of Pakistan, which was fairly short at that time. And LBJ uh, would get out ever so often to shake hands with a cluster of natives. Uh, he spied this camel driver who was standing by his camel, and he went over and shook hands with him, and in passing said, come see me at the LBJ Ranch sometime, because y'all come was a common term of the, both the Johnsons. Uh, the pre there was a columnist standing by, a Pakistani columnist, who wrote it in the Pakistani papers, how the Vice President of the United States had asked this humble man to come to his ranch. And the story persisted, and uh, by the time uh, we got back to Washington, uh, it had become monumental. Would the vice president receive him or not? So LBJ assigned that operation camel driver to me, and he said, you go and find the money to bring this man over, because he didn't feel like that we could uh, impose on the federal budget. And so uh, it led me to uh, the president of the People to People program, and they were delighted to sponsor uh, and pay for the ticket for our, the camel driver. The camel driver came, and Mrs. Johnson escorted the camel driver around Washington to see various sites. He was very polite. We fortunately had a good translator from the State Department, who also was a Pakistani. We went down uh, then to the LBJ ranch, and the president, uh, then vice president, had J. Frank Doby and other local characters in to meet him. And ultimately, we were going to take him to Dallas, where the state fair was on. And LBJ had been on the phone. He loved to do this kind of thing. Talked to his good friend, Henry Ford, and they were going to give him a, a truck for the camel driver to uh, 
uh, take and use and upgrade himself back in Pakistan. Uh, well, uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, had for fathers of Dallas <coughs> were going to have a luncheon for the camel driver. And it worried us a lot because we were afraid that the camel driver, who was uh, ate with his hands, uh, would be embarrassed to be seated at a table uh, with all of these uh, bank presidents and so forth. So we sent a wonderful advanced man, Charlie Boatner, up to Dallas. And he uh, was able to persuade them to have a menu where everything would be pickup food. And he, when he called me the night before we were going to uh, leave the ranch to go to Dallas, he said, well, it is going to be an unusual menu. We're going to have fried chicken and, and um, boiled eggs and carrot sticks, and everybody's going to be standing up at the luncheon. And sure enough, there were the city fathers all being expressing their kind of hospitality, which was to put themselves on the camel driver's level. The truck was presented by Vice President Johnson to the camel driver, and we got it sent back to Pakistan. And in the meantime, the, um, uh, the wait a minute. In the meantime, um, the truck was sent back. Okay. The truck was sent back to Pakistan, and at the, in the meantime, the vice president decided that it would be a good thing to send the camel driver back to Mecca because that would give him status in his own village. And sure enough, we found the ticket through the People to People program, and he went back that way, and he got more recognition uh, than he ever had before. Uh, I think life was good for him because he learned to drive the truck and he helped deliver things at the American Embassy, and often people would have him pointed out to them, and he would get them to write a card to Vice President Johnson to thank him once again for having made the trip to the United States possible. I think that that exchange program, which got great uh, accolades in the newspapers of Southeast Asia, uh, really did more than a lot of the exchanges of scholars. Just that simple act of a man who was very much at the head of his country, uh, being able to put out his hand and, and put his arm around an humble man from Pakistan. That's not the end of the story. The president of the People to People program was so impressed with this that uh, in a strange way, we ended up at the White House being given uh, the first silver piece, a, a beautiful silver urn used to serve coffee in the days of John and Abigail Adams. Uh, this man, Mr. Mark Bartman, had uh, collected, was a silver collector. He had acquired uh, through some uh, <clears throat> this man uh, Mark Bartman, a Bostonian, had acquired uh, the silver urn and he decided to present it to uh, President Ms. Johnson later when he became president. And that urn uh, is in the green room generally at the White House today. And it's one of the oldest pe pieces of silver in the White House, all because of the kindness of LBJ in inviting the camel driver. So the camel driver and Johnson together are the two that brought home uh, the John and the Abigail Adams coffee urn for the White House. Is that any good? Did you know that? You went to sleep. No, I'm just, yeah, I knew, knew everything except the coffee urn. I'd never, I'd never heard that story. <laughs> Whatever happened to the camel? It was great fun to travel with LBJ in campaigning because while he never was at ease in a 
TV studio in making speeches. When he could press the palms and feel the flush, he really came alive. And I had the fun of going on the 1960 campaign train with LBJ and Lady Bird uh, when we went campaigning by whistle stop. President Truman had been the one to advise Johnson to get on a train and go out and stop in the smaller towns, particularly through the South, because there are 47 stops you can make between Alexandria, Virginia, and New Orleans. And the LBJ liked this idea, and so we whipped together a whistle-stop train uh, with all the banners and the bunting and uh, the, the songs, The Yellow Rose of Texas, and started down the track from Washington. The first stop was Culpeper, Virginia. And uh, this is the point at which uh, we didn't know what would turn up on the track, but sure enough, the place was packed with people. And LBJ was on the back platform talking, and he got carried away, and he kept going on and on. Uh, Mrs. Johnson tugged at his coat to tell him that we better get on, Lyndon. Uh, he ignored her completely, and then uh, finally Jim Jones, who was the clock watcher, knew that we had 46 more stops to make, and there were people waiting along the tracks down the road. So he told the engineer to start pulling out slowly, and you had this hilarious sight of uh, Vice President Candidate Johnson uh, wailing away, still talking while the train was moving out and there was a whole battery of people disappearing in the background. And LBJ just had to have one more appeal and so he shouted down the track and I ask you what did Dick Nixon ever do for Culpepper? And an old man standing on the train track uh, shook his cane at the train and said, Hell, what did anybody ever do for Culpeper, Virginia? We bent back in 1964 on the Lady Bird special, and the night before we were to leave, it dawned on me we would be stopping in Culpeper. And I wondered, my kingdom, have we done anything for Culpeper? So I spent a busy time on the phone finding out how many Head Start projects, how many Job Corps training places, how many of everything had uh, become the bounty of Culpeper. And I was fortified, but nobody questioned that we had already done something for Culpeper. I'm trying to think. Uh, I can tell about how the White House Humor Group was born. Are these too far afield from Johnson? Okay, just a minute. Tell a story when, when he said Liz wanted to use your head. Oh. One time when LBJ had corralled Helen Thomas and uh, Francis Lewin, who was the AP person, like Helen was the UP pers person, they were down at the ranch visiting, and he put them both in his convertible and did what he really loved to do most of all, uh, and that was to uh, ride around looking at the ranch lands and looking for uh, where the deer and the antelope play, as he used to say. Uh, so uh, they were riding along, and I was in another car, and he was on a walkie-talkie to me. He loved to use gadgets, and he could use more of them at one time than anyone I've ever known. Uh, but he uh, got on the phone to me, and I had uh, made some error, and he said, uh, Liz, why don't you use your head? And I, being flamboyant female, uh, said, because I'm too busy using yours. There's a better way to tell that story. Uh, I mean, he was giving me so in many instructions. Um, well, that's the, way to, that's the way to do it. Tell it again? Yeah, sure. He was giving you so many instructions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could remember all the... The president liked to use gadgets. He was one of the first people I've ever known to own a TV set. And then as 
uh, time went on, he uh, got accustomed to walkie-talkies. And he had one from his car to all of the other ranch cars. And on one occasion, he had uh, asked me to go uh, ahead in a car to a ranch uh, nearby and be there when he arrived with Helen Thomas and Francis Lewin, the UP and AP women who covered the White House. He had them in the car and he was doing what he really loved doing, which was travel through the ranch lands where the deer and the antelope play, as he would say. Uh, well, he kept giving me instructions on which gate to go through and which turn to take, and uh, he was so fast I could barely take them. And finally he said, why don't you use your head, Liz? And I said, without thinking, I'm too busy using yours. Well, he turned to those two young women and said, if there's anything I hate, it's an uppity woman. But Johnson came to know uppity women, and I think to respect them, uh, because he nominated quite a few of them to higher positions while he was president. I was going to tell another one then. Oh, about speech writing. One morning I arrived at my office at the White House. I was on the east side of the White House where I was in charge of what you call women, dogs, and old brocades. I answered those questions. I didn't have to worry about national policy, uh, though you sometimes got scooped up by LBJ to do everything. And there was Jack Valenny standing at the door of my office, and he handed me a draft of a speech that the president was supposed to make to the Gridiron Club. And he said, LBJ said to give this to Liz and to tell her to sex this up. Well, this was not sex as we have come to know it in the White House in later years. But it was what I knew exactly what LBJ was talking about, which was to tell Liz to put in what he called jokes, topical humor. Well, there'd been a lot of mistakes made in the last week, and I knew I couldn't possibly find all the, the uh, corrections for them or write a funny line about them. So I gathered together a group called, uh, that we subsequently became named, known as the White House Humor Group. But we got together, uh, once a week, and we would supply him with introductions to speeches, particularly to uh, press groups. And there must be a dozen press groups in Washington that all demand a speech from the president every uh, year. And so you need humor constantly. Um, fortunately, I uh, had a friend who had worked for the Roosevelt administration, a guy named Ernie Cuneo, to come to these meetings. There would be about six or seven of us who gathered together, and Ernie Cuneo would arrive wisely with a briefcase in hand, and the briefcase held inside it a, a bottle of expensive scotch. And this happened in my office. We would. Uh, have a sip of scotch and become increasingly creative as we tried to supply lines to uh, President Johnson that would be humorous. Uh, the good days were when he liked the lines that we fed him and used them to good avail, but there were bad days when he would scribble on a draft, what's funny about this? And you'd have to end up explaining your own joke to the president, the man who was supposed to make them. But the scotch helped, and I must say that those were some of the happiest days of my life in the White House, to the best of my memory. Liz, I've always been curious. Every time you tell a story, you, you say uh, we drink... Uh, Sip scotch.